Uh, looking into uh, the, the book of Ruth today, I think this is yeah the fourth uh, one in a series that we're studying through the book of Ruth. And uh, I want to say that uh, we are so glad that everybody is here uh, in uh, Oklahoma City and also in uh, Clovis, New Mexico, in Servant's Heart Chapel. Uh, we're glad that you're with us today. And I am so excited to teach through this message. It has just been an inspiration to me. Um, if you're, if you're going to be a preacher, by the way, it better talk to you before you try to talk to anybody else about it. Uh, it better encourage you or it's not going to encourage anybody else. And so I am encouraged today uh, because God is sovereign and uh, his, uh, his hand is at work uh, even in the difficult moments of our life. And that's what this, uh, this message is going to be talking to you about today. Okay? The theme of Ruth, if you're taking notes, the theme of the book of Ruth that we're studying, the theme is redemption overall. It's, it's redemption. There are three things that God tells us in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, tells us that Jesus is for us. It says He is the wisdom from God. And it says three things. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. And those three things are really what God, what God is doing for us, kind of represents the whole picture, the whole package of what God is doing for us in the gospel, what he's doing for us in Jesus. Justification is or, uh, or is the forgiveness of sins. It's, uh, it's being, the, the record is cleared. The judge in heaven has said, I declare you not guilty because of what Jesus did did for us through his blood on the cross. Now, that's really great news, but if all God did was justify us and he didn't change us, well then Satan still kind of won, right? Sin is still ruling and reigning over us, but the good news is that Jesus is also our sanctification. He is making us holy. It's the transformation of our actual character to where I'm actually not the guy I used to be. I'm actually not the person that I once was. And um, I, I, I am so thankful, I'm so thankful that Jesus is not just forgiving our sins. He can do something more with sin than just forgive it. He can break its power in your life. He's sanctification for us. But he's also our redemption. Redemption is, uh, is the rescuing of all of life from the effects of sin. You get, uh, you get involved in people's lives as a pastor or even just as a Christian, if you do really just genuinely care about people, you get involved in people's lives and you see a lot of brokenness. You see a lot of broken hearts, broken lives, broken relationships. You see messed up, uh, tangled, weird uh, relationships and broken uh, hearts and broken uh, spirits where people are wounded because of abuse that they've suffered in the past at the hands of someone else or uh, maybe they've, they've broken relationships through abusive behavior of their own. A lot of times things come into people's lives and it just causes sin, causes all kinds of brokenness. And you get involved in people's lives, you really care about people, you'll find that's true. And so I am so hungry as a pastor, to see people really redeemed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just forgiven of the past, and not just made where there are new people in, in their hearts and their, their attitudes and things are different, but to see everything about their life touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they are really free from the brokenness of sin. I have seen sin mess up people's uh, credit score. You know what I'm talking about? It mess up their finances. I've seen people, I've seen sin uh, mess up people's uh, health. Their health is broken. I've seen that. I've seen people mess up uh, their, their relationship with their kids through sin. And I've, it, it, bre it breaks my heart. I want to see all of those things, the pieces picked up and put back together again. The beautiful thing is that this is what Ruth, the book of Ruth, is all about. Now the temptation is that we leave all of the work on one party or the other. Okay? In other words, all the work of redemption is on you. It's all on you. You've got to get everything fixed, and you've got to pick up all the pieces, and you've got to uh, fix your heart, and you've got to fix your life. And you've got to... The temptation is we could leave all the work on you. And if we do that, 
one of two things happens. Either it doesn't work out at all, and you fall into depression and despair and discouragement, and finally just throw up your hands and say, forget this Christianity thing, it's not working. Or you could, if, if you think it's all on you, you could, maybe it will work, and maybe it starts to fall into place, and you know what happens then? We get proud. We get arrogant. We get better than everybody else. Oh, I, I've, look what I've done. I've pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. The temptation is we could leave it all on ourselves. The other temptation is we could leave it all on God. Well, there's nothing I can do. It's all in God's hands. I'm just going to sit right here. I'm not going to do anything. And God can come bring me a new job. He can fix my finances all by himself. He's just going to drop money out of the sky. And so I'm going to sit right here and play the lottery and <laughs> wait for God's redemption. And neither one of those is actually accurate. You, know, you can't leave it all in God's camp, and you definitely can't leave it all in your camp. What, do you, what is the balance? Well, there are three things that really are going on in redemption. There's God, who's the sovereign and the starter of all of it. There's Ruth, the person being redeemed. And then there's Boaz. And that's who we're going to be looking at for a little bit today. Boaz is the guy that God brings around to help catalyze or push up the road what he's doing in the life of Ruth. He's going to be, Boaz is going to be the, the conduit, the channel, the, the, the pipe, if you will, for God's redemption to continue to flow into Ruth's life. So here we go in Ruth chapter 2, verse number 1. Let's just work our way through the scripture and I'll stop and make some comments as we go along. Ready? Ruth chapter 2 verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields, let me go to the fields and let me pick up uh, the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. And Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. Now, last week we talked about the, the importance of Ruth's, uh, her faith and getting her off that cycle of bad decisions. And so she has that faith. It, I, I love this girl. It's amazing. She's got initiative. Uh, she, comes, she comes to Naomi. She doesn't wait for Naomi to come to her and say, Would you get up and go to work? You're able-bodied. No, she comes to Naomi and says, Do you mind if I go? I'm going to go work. She's, so she's got initiative. She's a starter. Uh, she's got a willingness to work hard. She's got a willingness to work hard. She's not expecting Naomi to take care of her. Well, Naomi, I can almost hear the argument because I hear these kinds of arguments back and forth between husbands and wives or parents and kids or friends or whatever. Well, you're the one who knows everything about this culture. I don't know the culture. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I can't start it. You... I'm from Moab. They're not going to accept me. Why don't you get out there, Naomi, and do something? No, no, she doesn't. She's, she's willing to work hard. She comes to the, she's not expecting Naomi to care for her. She's saying, I'm going to take care of business myself. In fact, she's offering to take care of Naomi as well. Amazing. So she's taking responsibility, not just for her own self, but she's taking responsibility for others around her as well. This is a strong, strong girl. She's also got faith. Look what she said, in whose eyes I find favor. She's gonna, she said, I know I'm going to find favor in somebody's eyes. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to work hard and somebody's going to come along and bless me. Somebody's going to say, sure, you can glean in my field. Now, I know it's going to be hard work, but I'm going to find favor in somebody's eyes. She's got that faith. Verse number three, ready? So she went out and she began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself... I love that. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Okay, the same clan, I'm going to talk about why that's important here uh, later on when we get, uh, get to it, who was from the same clan as Elimelech. Now, I want to tell you, as it turned out, okay, there is no luck here. There's no chance here. No, absolutely not. Now, I use the phrase... How many of you sometimes use the phrase, good luck, or I wish you luck? Can you ever say, how many of you sometimes use that phrase? It's a cultural thing, right? We use it all the time. I use the same phrase, but let me tell you, there is ultimately no such thing as luck. Did you know that? There is no such thing as luck. I like the phrase, I think it was Mark Twain that said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. 
Okay, there's some parts of luck that are that. You know about those guys that are overnight successes? It usually comes right after 10 years of hard work, right? They work hard for 10 years and then they're an overnight success, just like that. There's, there's no such thing as luck. There is hard work and there is God's sovereignty. God is sovereign over everything. He is ruling and reigning and in charge. He is in charge of the details of your life. Now, this does sometimes mean, this does sometimes mean that things come into your life and you say, ouch, that's negative. God's sovereign. Why did he allow that into my life? I'm not going to deal with that all together right now, except to point you to the story of Ruth and say, sometimes God's just not done yet. Sometimes God's not, he's not finished yet. Ruth could be sitting in her house, depressed, discouraged, with her head in her hands saying, why did God allow my husband to die? Why? Why? I just don't understand. But instead, she's out working hard saying, I'm going to find favor in somebody's eyes. And lo and behold, as it turned out, as luck would have it, she winds up in the field of Boaz, a good man. You're going to see here in just a little bit. There's no chance here. There's no luck. There is God's sovereignty. God is ultimately in charge of what happens in your life. And that is really, really relaxing news. It's good news, but it's relaxing news. Because you're not ultimately responsible for everything that happens in your life. You're not. In fact, there's a scripture in Acts chapter 17 that points out to us, that it's not on your handout this morning, but it points out to us that the truth is you're not even responsible. There are many things in your life you can't control. You can't control where you were born. You can't control the family you were born into. You can't control the genes you were born with. You can't control any of those things. Guess who controlled all those things? Everybody say God. God did. He did. In fact, here's what he said. He said, he determined the times and places of their dwellings so that some of them would reach out for him and find him. In fact, the word is like grope for him, like a blind person. It's like reach out and try to find, in the darkness, reach out and try to find him. Did you know, every single person here, Teresa, Randy, Willie, Jackie, every single person, God put you in the family you were in. Did you know that? You say, I can't believe that. That was a horrible family. I had a terrible time. You know what? Let me tell you. God put you in the family you were in, not so that you could be abused and beaten and messed up in your life and twisted so, oh, for the rest of my life, I'm just a messed up, broken, damaged goods. No, you're not. God put you in the family that you were in. He put you in the place and the time you were in so that you would reach out for him and find him. That's why. He knew that what he needed to bring into your life, even if it involved the sin of other people, what they did wrong to you, though it was not right, he knew that if he allowed these things into your life sovereignly, that you would reach out and you would find him. He knew that you would be here on October, in October of, of 2014. He knew you'd be here. He knew you'd be here this Sunday morning listening to this message. And so he allowed things into your life so that you would reach out for him. Grope for him in the darkness of your life and find him. That's why. There's no luck here. So next time you think, oh, just a turn of good luck. Oh, no, 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 no. It's something to be thankful for. Something to be thankful for. Now, verse number four, just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Now, I'll just stop and say here, Boaz, the, his name means strength. Strength. He's a strong guy. He's a, he's a, he's a man of men. He's a, a, a dude of dudes. All right? This is a good guy. In fact, he's a great boss. He obviously, he loves God and he's a good boss. He comes in and he comes to, to his workers, all the harvesters in his field. And he says, the Lord be with you. How many of you went to work this week and your boss is like, the Lord be with you? <laughs> right, that doesn't happen much, right? You know, they're more like they're like, why are you late? Why are you? you know, that's kind of the way bosses tend to run, right? But this guy's a good man. Man, he's a good guy. He, he comes to you, the Lord be with you. God bless you. How are you doing this morning? He's a good boss. Verse 5, Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, whose young woman is that? Ah, and so it begins. 
In fact, maybe right here, if we were, if I was really on top of it, I would have some music. I would have some soft uh, string music playing, you know, just something, something quiet, and it would slow time down. And Boaz would turn his head in slow motion, and he would see the girl, and it would zoom in on his face, and he'd look. Yeah, right. It's a chick flick, okay? That's what's going on here. It's, he sees, and he says, who is that? That young woman right there, where did she come from? You know, Ruth catches Boaz's eye. And so it begins. In fact, here's what he does. He goes immediately, in verse 5, he goes and checks her out by asking somebody he trusts. He has a friend. He's got a guy that's been there. She's been observing the foreman of his harvesters, obviously a man of integrity, a man trustworthy, and he goes and checks her out. He asks, he says, uh, um, whose young woman is that? Where'd she come from? By the way, nothing wrong with getting the scoop, young men. Nothing wrong with getting the scoop on the girl before you go commit yourself to having dates with her, all right? There's nothing wrong with that. You check it out. You get somebody you trust. You ask somebody's opinion. You seek out a person of wisdom. And you say, hey, who's that? What's, what's she like? What's going on with her? Now, let me just give you a little note here. This is very important. Not everybody you meet is moving toward real redemption. And if they're not, you're wasting your time. Let me tell you why I said this, because I taught through this on Sunday night a while back. Uh, a while back, I taught through this, on, this series, through the book of Ruth, on Sunday nights. And uh, I, I was talking about Boaz's role in being a redemptive person, in redeeming the lives of, of somebody else. And my wife, one evening, we were talking after, after I'd preached this, and she said, she said, I don't know if I want my sons just redeeming any old girl. And I said, oh, you're exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, if, if somebody's not moving toward redemption on their own, you're wasting your time. You don't want to, you don't want to just go throw yourself in, oh, look, there's a beautiful girl who is way off the deep end over there. Someone should redeem her. And I think, I'm the man to do it. All right, that, that's not really what we're talking about here. If you're not, if you're not, move, if the person you meet is mo not moving toward redemption, you're wasting your time. But you know what? There are some good ladies out there who are learning to love Jesus, and Ruth is one of those people, and she's moving. And so Boaz checks it out. He's che he checks it out. He's just just wanting to make sure. And guess what? Verse six. The friend report comes back good. Let's look at it. The foreman replied, "She is the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi." And she said, "Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters." And she went into the field, and she has worked steadily from morning until now, except for a short rest in the shelter. Oh, that's a good report. That's a really good report. This girl, she, is, she was bold. She came and asked. She was polite. May I please go serve in the, in the gather behind the harvesters? Remember last year, what, last week, when I was talking about the gleaning custom? The gleaning laws in, in Israel, I almost said Oklahoma, the gleaning laws in Israel meant that if you dropped grain, you were not allowed to go back and pick it up. Okay? You're, cutting, you're cutting and harvesting your grain with your sickle, and you cut a stack and scoop it up, and you cut another stack and scoop it up. Whatever grain drops, you're not allowed to pick it up. God said, you have to leave it there. Well, that's not very fair. I'm not going to get rich doing that. Well, the reason he did it was because of poor people. He said, I want you to leave it for the poor in your land so they can come behind you and gather the grain that is left over. If you forget a sheaf and leave it out there in the field when you're carrying them back to your barn, you're not allowed to go back and get it. You have to leave it there to bless somebody else. That's, that's good. That's thoughtful. God built caring for the poor right into the laws of the land. And so, this girl is out there and she's gleaning. By the way, this would be very back-breaking work, would it not? Very difficult work. You're leaning over all the time. You're carrying. You're picking up grain. It is hard. You're bending. and oh, Wow. She's working hard. She has worked steadily from morning until now. The guy says, she's up early, she's doing her stuff, she's taking care of business, and except for she takes reasonable breaks, 
Did you see that? Except for a short rest in the shelter. She knew when to take a break, but she took short breaks. You ever seen somebody who took long extended breaks? They'd come up a little early for a break and they'd stay a little after for a break. You know what I'm talking about? Don't poke your neighbor, okay? Don't do it. Don't poke your husband. Don't poke your wife. You know what I'm talking about? Long extended breaks and short bursts of work. Yeah, I've seen those people. Now let me tell you this. This is important. Your character will show up. It will show up. If you're a hard worker, it'll show up. If you're lazy, it'll show up. It will. Your character goes before you. Now, in fact, body shows up immediately, character shows up later. Now you, ladies, you want to be beautiful. You want to be beautiful, you want to make a good first impression. Nothing wrong with first impressions, I understand that. But let me tell you, more than the face, character is going to show up. You can, if you can fool them for so long by the way you dress, and the way, but who you are, not what you look like, is eventually going to come out. I promise you it will. And so Boaz catches a, a look at this girl from a distance. I'm going to go out on a limb and say, in fact, when I, I told people I was on Facebook, I was going to be preaching through this, and a girl that I knew in Kentucky wrote me a, a note and said, in her Sunday school class, she, she said, I was talking about how Boaz saw this girl, I was teaching through Ruth, and I told the kids, a little, I think it was like junior high boys, told them that Boaz saw this girl in the field, and the boy, one boy pop, piped up and said, she must have been a hottie. <laughs> Now, I don't know about all that, but uh, the Sunday school class is over at that point. Everybody's laughing. So the, he said uh, he caught a glimpse of her, but he checks out not just what she looks like, but he checks out her character. Because what you look like may look totally different in 10 years, but who you are here, oh, that's forever. That matters. It really does. So notice this, that what attracts Boaz to Ruth his character. Now he's, the first impression, okay, he sees her, she's pretty, I'm guessing she probably, probably was. He sees her and she's like, who is that? But after that, after that first, she's nice looking, after that it's character. What really draws him to her is character. Now he already has character. He already has it. Men, take note, all you men. He already has character. He, he's, he loves God. He's not going to hell. He's got a job and a place and a life, and he's doing well taking care of them. This guy is doing it. It's happening. He's got character. Looks like she's got it too. And character is drawn to character. Now, that's free. That's not even on your handout. In fact, you ought to write that one down. Character is drawn to character. If you have character, if you are a person of integrity and strength and all that, here, you're going to be drawn to somebody else who's like that as well. They'll, they'll pull, there will be a pull there to you. And so, what should you do if you want to find a good girl? Abraham wants to find a good girl. Yeah, Jamin found a good girl. What do you want to do if you want to find a girl like that? The answer is you become a guy like that. Everybody, all the ladies, would you say amen for me? Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's good preaching, Daryl. <laughs> You want, to find, you want to find a girl like that, you become a guy like that. That's what you do. Find your pants, get a job, love Jesus. Verse number eight. Now, you kind of, you, you'll kind of want to read this. This is Boaz talking for the first time. You kind of want to read this with a deep kind of Barry White kind of voice. Maybe not Barry White, but somebody, right? You, you want to read this with a... A good, would you, <laughs> Jamin's asking back there, would you like me to read it for you? No. <laughs> and Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do it. I wish I had one of those voices. Go in, or don't, don't, he says, don't go and glean in another field. And don't go away from here. Ah, he wants to keep her close. Stay here with my servant girls. Ah. I like this. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the other servant girls. I have told the men not to touch you. And wherever you're, whenever you're thirsty, go get a drink from the water jars that the men have filled. Oh, he's concerned for her. He's looking out for her. 
I mean, this, here's some good, for, my servant girls, let me go and introduce you to some of them. Here's these girls, you stay with them. They're, uh, they're, they're nice, they're good girls. I, I'm looking out for you, some good friends for you. You're not one, he's not one of those guys who like, stay by me and don't have any friends. You know, he's not one of those guys he's looking out for, her. he's got good friends for her. He cares because she needs good friends. She's in a tough time of her life. She needs some good friends. He's looking out for her. And he says, I want you to gather right along. Just get, stay with me. Stay with my guys. I've told the men not to touch you. This is like the first sexual harassment policy in the Bible. I've told the men not to touch you. In fact, Boaz is a guy, he takes care of business. I can almost hear the conversation. Guys, come here. See that girl over there? If any of you so much as lifts a finger and bothers her, I own a lot of fields. They will never find your body. <laughs> I'm going to go Old Testament on you. They will never find you, right? You don't touch her. <laughs> you don't. That girl, she's under my protection. It's a good guy. That's a good guy. He's looking out for her. nobody else. Nobody else. Staking my claim, all right? You, she's under my protection. He's a, he's a provider. Look at that. He's like, uh, he's like, I'm going to take care of you. Boaz is going to take care of you. He's a protector. He's a defender. Chivalry. Anybody remember that word? Old word, chivalry. It's that word that makes men uh, open the door for a lady that says, oh, let me help you carry that. That says, here, here's an umbrella that says, let me walk on the street side of the sidewalk. I'm old school that way, okay? That's the way it ought to be. Everybody, ladies, would you say amen? Yes, that's the way it ought to be. Because we're, it is not disrespect. It's not, it's not disrespect. It is respect. We care for you. God has wired us up to be defenders and protectors. And Boaz is doing a good job. You do the same thing, right? You can be strong for your girl or you can be strong against your girl. Don't do it. Don't do that one. You, be, you use your strength the right way. Use your strength the right way. You be strong for her. You be strong in defending her, looking out for her. Look at verse 10. Oh, by the way, let me just point out one more thing. Do you notice he's not doing this with all the girls? Not on the same level. Now, he's, uh, he's a chivalrous guy, but he's not doing this with all the girls. He's smart. He sees a good girl. He's going to take good care of a good girl. Verse 10, at this she bowed down with her face to the ground. And she exclaimed, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? She is dirty. Her face is streaked. I'm assuming. She's been out working in the fields all day except for a short break in the shelter. Of course, she's dirty. She's sweaty. She's a foreigner. She's living in a 10-year-old, broken down, neglected house with a bitter mother-in-law. But you know what? She's respectful. She's humble. She's thankful. God, ladies, let me just tell you something. You can get a long way with men. You can get a long ways with men by being respectful, humble, and thankful. Did you know that? You can. It is absolutely true. I, I, I don't really have time to go into it, but you need to check out Love and Respect, the book, and there's a conference that goes along with it. Dr. Emerson Egrich, Love and Respect, he said, I want to do a test with some ladies. And some ladies came to me and they said, they said, I want you to, they, we want you to teach us how to be respectful to our husbands. He was pastoring a church, and the ladies came and said, we'd like you to teach, you, teach us how to, actually, they said, I want to teach you how to love your husband, how, teach us how to love our husbands better. And he said, I'm not going to do it. And they said, what, what, why? And he said, because you don't need to love your husbands, you do that automatically. You need to respect them. And they said, well, what? What do you mean? And he said, let me give you a test this week just to prove to you that what you don't need is going and loving your husbands more. He said, I want, to, I want to give you a test this week. He said, I want you to go into your husband. Wait till he's been home for a little bit. He sits down. He's reading the paper or whatever. And then go into the room where he is and just stand there looking at him for a minute. And then say, you know what? I was thinking about you today. And when he grunts or says, oh yeah? Say, I was thinking about all the things I respect about you. And then he said, and then he said, this is key. Turn around and walk out of the room. And he said, the next week they came back. They came back and he said, they were telling me, oh, I was just blown away. One of them said, he got up and followed me. 
several of them said, he got up and followed me. He said, one of them came in and said, what things? <laughs> what things are you respecting? <laughs> Tell me, man. I mean, not, not that it's that important. I, uh, uh, but uh, go ahead. No, I'm serious. Women speak love, men speak respect. We speak a respect language. We have blue hearing aids. That's what we hear from, okay? You have a pink megaphone, and that's what you speak from. And we, you understand that we don't, you, you want to communicate, you got to speak the blue hearing aid language. And that's how you do it. Respect. This girl is respectful. She's humble. She's thankful. She's expressing her gratitude for all that he does. What a great thing, right? She doesn't throw herself at him, but she does keep herself in front of him. And she just shows a humble, respectful attitude. Number 11, verse number 11, Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. Wow, her reputation is going before her. By the way, your reputation almost always goes before you, or if it doesn't, if they don't know you, it'll, it'll show up pretty soon. Your reputation goes in front of you. And so he's heard. He says, I've heard about your past. Yeah, she was born on the wrong side of the tracks, not from a good place. But he says, I've heard about your past, but I've also heard how you've turned toward God. Your reputation goes before you. You were too willing to take a big risk. You've turned to the Lord, and I admire you for that. Now look at this. Ruth has been through the hardest time of her life. This is a hard, difficult, hard season she's been through. She has been buried a husband. She's buried a, a father-in-law. She's buried a brother-in-law. She's supported a mother-in-law. She's lost her sister-in-law who went back. She's moved to a new land with new customs. She started a new job. Just hours ago she was hungry. Just hours ago, she was hungry. Right? They came on a 10-day journey from Moab, and it's a, just not that long. I mean, she, she is going, coming through the hardest, most difficult day of her life. And I want you to look at verse number 12, guys. This is huge. Look at this. Boaz prays a blessing over this girl. She is, a, she is just broken down. Now, she's working hard and she's sweating, but she is coming out a hard, emotionally wrenching season. And Boaz says, may the Lord, this is a prayer, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz, I, I don't know if I can explain to you how touching and gracious and powerful this moment is. Ladies, when they're in a difficult moment, guys, when they're in a hard moment, you have the power to bless her or curse her. You have the power to build her up or tear her down. Because sometimes she's had a difficult, hard day. And all five kids have screamed. And homeschool has been hard. Okay, I'm just bringing you my life, okay? You know what I'm saying? Homeschooling has been frustrating. And their room got, didn't get cleaned up. And they tried to make, make Play-Doh out of cornstarch. And, and, and it's everywhere. No, I'm just bringing the truth, okay? It's, this is literally what happened. They, it, the kids tried to make cornstarch the other day. And they tried to make Play-Doh, I mean, out of cornstarch. They're trying, mixing it up. And you know what cornstarch does, right? It goes everywhere. It's that fine dust. And some days you come home and it's been a hard day. I know you had a hard day too. I know. I know. But, but look at this blessing he, he doesn't bless, he doesn't curse her. He doesn't say, man, girl, what are you doing? What are you doing here? Why, why do you? No, instead, he blesses her. She's moving toward the Lord and she doesn't need him to tear her down and point out all the things. Now, you could do this differently and this differently and this differently. And boy, if you'd step up in this area. And also, have you considered taking a shower? <laughs> he, he doesn't tear her down. He blesses her. And let all the ladies say amen one more time. Thank you. 
continue on? All right. He's like, he's like okay, move along now. All right, you've camped out there long enough, Daryl. Let's move on. All right, look at this. And she says, may I continue? Oh, l- l- actually, I skipped a blank. I skipped a blank. Yeah, let me get this. Sometimes God sends you to answer your own prayers. Okay. Lord, please help my wife to feel loved. You're it. Right? God's like, certainly, get started. Okay? He's, you know, seriously, God's like, I will do that. Now, you love her and love her well. Instead, in fact, you love her this much, step it up. All right? Learn how to love her even more. Learn how to make her feel loved. Oh, there's so many things I could say right here. Okay? So many things I could be bringing out right here. Tell him I said hi, Willie. All right. <laughs> There's so many things I could bring out right here, but let me tell you this. The truth is, men, if you will, if you will listen to the voice of the Lord, sometimes you'll hear him, you'll hear him saying, You're the answer to the prayer that you just prayed. It's you. You want a better home? Go get it. You want a, you want a wife who feels loved? Go love her. Ladies, sometimes it might be you too. I just wish my husband was more understanding. Okay, learn how, to, learn how to relate to him. Learn how to speak his language. In fact, look, Ruth does that in the next verse. May I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord. She said, respect, respect. My Lord, may I continue to find favor in your eyes. You have given me comfort and have spoken kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servant girls. Again, she's humble, she's respectful, she's thankful, she recognizes how kind he's been. Now let me tell you something the New Testament says about beauty, about true beauty, okay? All you ladies, you want God's beauty tip? Here it is. In 1 Peter 3, uh, verses 3 and 4, paraphrase says this, let your decoration... Be the jewelry of a humble, a humble and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's eyes. Wow. Humble, respectful, thankful. God says, now that is a jewel worth purchasing right there. Ladies, you have an opportunity to show your guy respect. How do you speak to him? I had a lady call this week and tell, call, talk to me and talk, call her boyfriend the old man. No. Now, if that's a joking title between you and your husband or a significant other, God bless you, okay? Maybe it really works for you. Uh, don't call me that. <laughs> no, the old man. No, that's not me. My Lord. Now, if you want to do that, that'd be fine. We could, we could work with that. <laughs> I'm just joking. You know what? My wife is, is incredibly respectful. She has learned, she has learned how to speak the language I speak. It's phenomenal. And I love it. I would do anything for that girl. You know, because I, I, I know she respects me. I feel it. I feel it. You have the power, ladies. You want to be beautiful. It's not about Botox. It's not about cosmetic surgery. It's not even about your, your out, outward dress and adornment. It's about attitude jewelry. Right. Verse 14. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread, dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain, and she ate all she wanted to have some, had some left over. This guy is looking out for her. It's a dinner date. It's a dinner date, and she's sweaty and been working all day long, and it's a dinner date. He says, hey, come over here, come over here. Let me have some. She had all she wanted. There was some left over. At verse 15, as she got up to glean again, she's going back to work. After lunch, she stopped for lunch break. Now she's going on to, uh, to, uh, have a, to keep working. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, even if she gathers among the sheaves. Okay, apparently this is like a cultural practice. You're supposed to stay behind where they're bundling up the sheaves. And he says, even if she gathers among the sheaves, don't embarrass her. Okay? He's looking out for her. She's new here. She doesn't know all the customs. Guys, watch out for this girl. Even if she's you know, gathering up further than she's supposed to. In fact, he says, look at this. Pull some stalks out from the bundles and drop them for her. Leave them for her to pick up and don't rebuke her. 
Now, this is what's so beautiful. Boaz goes beyond the law. The law said if you drop it, you can't pick it up. He's saying take some and drop it on purpose. He's saying pull some out. You've already worked doing all the bundling. As you're walking by, his roof coming right there. Watch this. Yeah. Leave that for big handful. Yeah. What is this? He's going beyond the law all the way to grace. The law says you've got to do this much. And grace says I'm doing more. The law says, you have to at least do this. And grace says, ah, but I can do this. I can do more. I can go beyond what I have to do. That's grace. That's love. Now, let me tell you this. The reason this is so incredible is because Boaz is, is a type. He's a picture of Jesus. And I've got to bring this around to the good news, the gospel. Because the good news is this, that you and I, we're Ruth. We're Ruth. We're the one from the wrong side of the tracks. We're the foreigner who showed up in God's land. And just as, just as Jesus, just as Boaz came and surveyed his field, so Jesus came down and surveyed his harvest field. And just as Boaz saw Ruth, Jesus looked and saw you. And just as Boaz went beyond the law, beyond what he had to do, Jesus went beyond the law and fulfilled the law for you and for me. He kept it perfectly and then went beyond it and died on a cross for you and for me. He didn't have to. He did it because he was gracious and kind. And, and just like Boaz became a protector and a provider, so Jesus has become our protector and our provider, and he looks out for us. That's what it is all about. This is what it's all about. The good news, the gospel, redemption is possible, and it's all given by one man, and that's Jesus. And if you don't know him, you need to get to know him because he has given us everything that we need. He's gone beyond the law. The law said you deserve hell. Jesus said, I'll take that punishment. Father, put me on a cross. Turn your back on me. Don't turn your back on them. Turn your back on me instead. And so the sky got dark and Jesus cried out, my God, why have you forsaken me? Instead of you screaming that in hell for all of eternity, Jesus cried it once and for all on a cross for you. Instead of you being shut out from the presence of God, God turns his back on his own son and pours out his anger and wrath for your sin and mine on that man on the cross for six hours one Friday. And so I, my challenge to you, my challenge to you is this. Would you turn your eyes toward the one who came and surveyed his field and caught sight of you and said, I'm going to be kind to you. You don't deserve it, but I'm pouring out grace on top of grace. Wait till you see the redemption I have for your life. And Boaz is going to go even more than that in the, few, in the future weeks. He's going to do even more. And guess what? Jesus is not done with you either. He's done a lot for you already. You're here, you're awake, you're alive. That's a blessing. He's taken care of you this week. That's a blessing. But wait till you see what he has for you. You can't even imagine how great it's going to be. Would you bow your heads with me?